Ever since I read Chaos by Tom O'Neill, I've been wanting to read more about the late 60s, 70s, LSD, and now even going into the 80s and the Satanic Panic. And fortunately, I came across Unmask Alice on Book Talk of All Places by a Rick Emerson, LSD, Satanic Panic, and the imposter behind the world's most notorious diaries. I devoured this book in a weekend. Just the title alone, I knew that I was going to be interested despite not knowing anything about the topic. Obviously, I knew about LSD and the satanic panic, but I had no idea who Alice was or this diary. I was a 90s baby. I did not grow up in this time period, so I learned quite a bit. I gave it five out of five with a couple of, you know, caveats to that. Again, I wasn't born during this time period. For some people who may have been very familiar with who Alice was and the author Beatrice Sparks might have a different opinion. They might not have learned a whole lot, so they might have a lower rating for it. It does have like a 4.01 or something like that out of five on Google. Goodreads, which is pretty good for Goodreads. Before we go any further, my name is Patches. I want to introduce myself, and I love consuming morbidly curious media, whether it's documentaries, books, anything. Anything that scratches that morbidly curious part of my brain, which possessed me to start the Morbidly Curious Book Club. It's an 18 plus nonfiction book club where we read kind of the darker parts of your library. It's been such a fun project. We're almost now a year in, and it's really rewarding and I love reading stuff with like-minded people that maybe don't think I'm as weird. <laughs> Unmask Alice is actually our September book, so if you don't want to hear too much about it before you have read it, I would suggest skipping this video until after our meeting and I will be uploading our meeting to the YouTube page. You can actually go back and look at my page and see all of our dis past discussions. So let's talk about this book. I've actually tried to record this a couple of times and I just keep getting caught up in all of the facts that I just want to portray to you. But at the same time, I want people to read this. So it's, I keep getting hung up with how much to tell you and how much to stray away from. A couple of things I really liked about this book, the prose, which is strange because this is a nonfiction book. You don't really search for prose in a nonfiction book, but this was incredibly well written. It's very gripping. I have found recently that I'm having a hard time paying attention while I'm reading. My mind tends to wander. I get drawn and sucked back into social media. So it is kind of tricky for me to read a book without the audiobook playing in my ears along with it as if somebody's reading it to me. But this one, there's no audiobook that I know of, but I was still able to blow through the 400 pages in a weekend because I just could not stop consuming it. It was so well done. And some of the stuff that I liked, such as his footnotes, uh, a lot of people didn't like. Some people did have an issue with some of the topics. Some people had issues with how the topics were handled. Some people didn't like the fact that there was so much drug talk in it, despite LSD being in the title, to each their own. I don't think Rick Emerson has written anything else. There's not, it's not mentioned in the book, but when and if he does, I will absolutely be picking it up. Because I really love the way he constructed this story. Even in his author's note, he tells you, you know, this is going to be a, a ride. This is going to be a journey because this is one of those things where, man, if you just open one door, there's 50 other doors that you have to look through. But I do think he did this very well to the best of his abilities because in order to start at one place, you need to step back and look at it. Even all the way back to 1943, there's a chapter in here where we talk about the Swiss chemist Albert Hoffman who accidentally invented LSD which is equally as important because at first it was helping people. But again, see, I'm getting ahead of myself. So essentially though, as a brief summary, in the early 70s, a book appeared at a couple of different desks unsolicited, a couple of different news agencies around the country. It was very small, no cover art and a strange like note on the front, but there was like no price tag and more alarmingly no name. It just said written by anonymous, which intrigued people, but they did need that little three by five card to kind of tell them what they were getting into because presumably some people probably would have just thrown it away. It was titled Go Ask Alice, Author Anonymous. This special pre-publication paperback book that you hold in your hands is, in our estimation, one of the most gripping, terrifying, and socially important books that we at Prentice Hall have ever published. We feel confident that you will share our enthusiasm and dedication to bring the published edition to the attention of every parent and young person in your community. Once you open the book, there is a startling introduction. Go Ask Alice is based on the actual diary of a 15-year-old drug user. It is not a definite statement of the middle class, teenage drug world. It does not offer any solutions. It is, however, a highly personal and specific chronicle. As such, we hope it will provide insights into the increasing
increasingly complicated world in which we live. Names, dates, places, and certain events have been changed in accordance with the wishes of those concerned. It's 159 pages of somebody's personal diary, which offered a very voyeuristic aspect and people didn't really look away. And everybody, for the most part, ate this up. They thought, wow, that could be my daughter, that could be my niece, that could be me. And people were blown away by its success. The author of Go Ask Alice, kind of, was Beatrice Sparks. She was hell-bent on becoming somebody. And it seemed like every time she had a great opportunity at hand, the rug would just be ripped right out from under her. She had various different jobs here and there. She did have a couple of books. She did work on a couple of comments with people like Joe Barbera, who was a part of Tom and Jerry. And eventually she became associated with Art Linkletter, who became associated with Nixon because of Art Linkletter's daughter's suicide. Again, it's like a tree, like you have to map out this story. But essentially Beatrice Sparks wanted to become somebody. She wanted to be an author. She wanted to be a therapist. She wanted to be a psychiatrist. And she wanted to study all of these things. However, Beatrice Sparks never graduated high school, I believe it was, despite telling people that she had a very elaborate degree from UCLA. This book really shows you how easy it was to get away with stuff back in the day. You could lie like a rug about yourself and people wouldn't ask questions. So back in 1943, Swiss chemist Albert Hoffman was working for a company because there was big money in asthma treatment at the time. And somehow, <laughs> accidentally, took 250 micrograms of LSD. It was about like a little piece of sugar piece. How do you say a little piece of sugar? Like a little grain of sugar. People thought he was sick or poisoned. He forgot how to ride a bike. He couldn't write well, but was happy. Like he was very okay with what was going on. So it shows like some parts of LSD can be very good and some parts can be very bad. Some people would have very bad hallucinations and very morbid thoughts and body horror and horrible dreams and they would hallucinate, which is kind of like what happened to Alice in this diary. So we do eventually meet Art Linkletter and he was known as like a family man back during those times and people really looked up to him. And suddenly in the late 60s, his daughter jumped out of a window and commit suicide. And she had been depressed which is a topic we will cover later on. Depressed really wasn't a thing at that time. And according to Diane and Art's son, Diane's brother, Robert, Diane had actually contacted Robert and told him that she had taken LSD before she did her jump. Now, we can't really say for sure if this is true. You can't really test for LSD. The military doesn't even do it. It's very hard to do on a living person and especially hard to do on a dead person. But they were able to find in her system no other drugs. So it's very strange that he would say this if it wasn't true, but it was very unlike Diane to do something like this. But that is the story that Art went with. There were many, many articles about Diane being consumed by this drug and how horrible it was. Also, remember the time period. We have Manson. This was for good previous Christian white girls or whatever, now sitting in a courthouse with X's on their forehead. We have the war on drugs. And speaking of the war on drugs, Nixon actually did take notice of what happened to Linkletter and the Linkletter family. So essentially they devised a plan to come up with a way to get parents aware, teenagers scared, and children to not even think about LSD and what could happen. So this is where Beatrice Sparks kind of shimmies her way into the picture. And she comes up with a couple of different ideas. And she happens to tell them, oh, by the way, I stumbled across this diary, which I think you should read. Let me edit it and put it together. No one really asked where she got this diary from. They didn't really question it because once she put it together, they were blown away by how incredible it was. And we still won't really know for sure where she got this diary because she would later claim that it was part of her practice and it would be from somebody that she worked with as a psychiatrist. And again, really no proof that she ever was a psychiatrist. And even in the book, they question if Beatrice Sparks was her real name because she was very elaborate in her lies and headstrong on them despite there really being no proof. There's no record of her ever attending UCLA. That's where Go Ask Alice came from. And people loved it. They had to make batches upon batches of copies of this book. People were stealing it from the library and people were also up at arms at some of the provocative tones in the book. It was eventually pulled from some libraries. You couldn't rent it unless you were over 16, even with parent uh, permission. I don't remember if it was exactly 16 years old, but 
they wanted people to read it, but they also, like, had it as a banned book. Like, you actually could not pick this out of the library for a while if you were a young child. We get to part two of the book, and this is where it kind of comes to a screeching halt, in my opinion, but it eventually worked out. Part two of this book felt like its own book in itself. We are back in Utah, in Pleasant Grove, Utah specifically, meeting a family that is very Mormon and has a very troubled child. Alden Barrett, from a kid, was very aggressive and really didn't know how to handle his anger. And then once he got older, had a lot of cl conflicting thoughts on religion and what his parents were teaching and Nixon. And he found solace in the debate club because it finally felt like a safe space where he was able to ask questions without being reprimanded. He did have kind of an abusive home. His parents were very strict on him and very aggressive towards his lifestyle choices. Keep in mind, too, this is getting towards... An inching towards the 80s and the satanic panic starts to come into play as well. One thing that was true about Alden Barrett was he did in fact keep a diary. This is true. And in it he would question his parents' authority and he would question the religion and he would just finally had a place to write poetry and to just word vomit exactly how he was feeling. He eventually met a girl at school. Things were going kind of well for a while. Ultimately, though, Alden was very depressed. And despite seeing a psychiatrist, which was great on behalf of his family, they did firmly believe that depression was a thing and the brain and science were real. But his psychiatrist just kept saying that Alden was fine. But his depression and demons caught up to him. And Alden did eventually commit suicide with his father's gun. And that is a very, very, very brief summary of what exactly is all happening in part two of this book. But while cleaning up the mess and while going through some of Alden's belongings, they did find his diary and his mother didn't really pay too much attention to it until she read Go Ask Alice. And she kind of wanted, similar to how Art felt about Diane, wanted to put something out there to tell people that drugs were scary. In the diary, she did discover that Alden was familiar with LSD and he did kind of test drugs every so often. So she got in contact with a Beatrice Sparks and no paperwork signed, nothing really agreed upon. She gave Beatrice Sparks the diary and hoped it would be something very similar to Go Ask Alice. Unfortunately, that was not the case, which is where the darker side, I think, of Beatrice Sparks comes in. This part was very infuriating. Essentially, she only took bits and pieces of Alden's diary and put forth some sort of book, but she made Alden seem like a completely different person. And again, this is the time of West Memphis Three, Dungeons and Dragons, Son of Sam, people were freaking out that the devil was everywhere. Mormons and Christians alike, everybody was freaking out. It's one of my favorite topics to study, to be honest. The satanic panic is fascinating to me for numerous reasons, um, mostly for its obscurity, but besides the point. She added lots of entries that weren't true, including occult themes and saying that Alden was an occultist and interested in Satan and essentially doing the drugs, gave himself over to the devil and tied those together. And the book goes on to say, because a lot of critics would say that what would become Jay's journal, she changed Alden's name to Jay, Jay's journal would be the start of the satanic panic, which in my opinion is a little bit of a stretch, but it definitely has a major factor in it. Hi, editing patches here. I realize I actually made a mistake saying this. What I think I was thinking about was here on page 223, where Rick Emerson is discussing Dangerous Games, which was a 2015 study of 1980s social hysteria. Religious studies professor Joseph Laycock described the wire crossing moment. Laycock says many Americans truly did feel an invisible force that seemed to be all around them, corrupting their children and undermining the values of the family. Jay's journal exploited these fears and connected them to larger concerns about adolescence. Jay also established the narrative of teenagers as brilliant victims who are vulnerable because they are geniuses. Jay's journal helped trigger the satanic panic. So it was not critics, it was this 2015 study. Carry on. Because it put the idea in parents' minds that suddenly if your child is reading Stephen King, wearing silver jewelry, playing Dungeons and Dragons, they have sold themselves to the devil. And the Barretts were just baffled at what she did with their son's diary. And Alden's father, Doyle, didn't want her to hand over the diary at all. 
And it was kind of scandalous to suddenly have people know because everybody knew. Everybody knew what the situation was and they didn't want to bring a lawsuit into it because that was equally as scandalous. And unfortunately, the Barrett family did try and talk to Beatrice Sparks about this and all she did was bring them raving reviews. J Journal was just as much of a success as Alice was. Alice was, I think, a little bit more successful. In the book, he actually lists off warning signs that your child is now into devil worship. Listens to heavy metal playing fantasy and or occult themed games, such as Dungeons and Dragons, reading books by Stephen King, skepticism towards organized religion, skepticism towards patriotic ideals, talking in rhyme, owning bells or gongs, black clothing, silver jewelry, heavy makeup, a strong belief in individualism, intense introspection, and clove cigarettes. But the list was, quote, effectively endless. I am not much of a silver jewelry person. I like gold more. But again, people were scared. The number of teenage suicides were just through the roof at this time. And it was very unsuspecting people. It was mostly teenage boys. It was mostly white teenage boys. And people were trying to pin something to answers as to why their children were suddenly taking their own lives. Now, eventually, Jay's journal got a new cover and a little bit of a name change. It would say Jay's journal by Anonymous, edited by Dr. Beatrice Sparks. She'd been saying it for years, Dr. Beatrice Sparks. No one had objected or even raised an eyebrow. She planned to get a real degree someday. Eventually, the last part of the book lands us in the early 90s, where there seems to be a new book about AIDS. Apparently, this new book that is out is from the mastermind who brought us, go ask Alice, Beatrice Sparks. Dr. Beatrice Sparks, excuse me. And it's kind of got a similar theme about a girl who keeps a diary. Her name is Nancy and she has just contracted AIDS. There's a lot of things wrong with this. It seems that Beatrice Sparks has yet again created some sort of fictional character and put it in a world that is relevant to the world in which they were in. And some might say there's not necessarily anything wrong with that. What she did with Jay's journal and the Barrett family, of course, that uh, has a lot of issues. But what's necessarily wrong with writing about a book that is prevalent to the time period? With this new book of Nancy contracting AIDS, one of the major problems, though, was Beatrice Sparks was supposed to, because the publishing company told her she had to, was get permission, in a sense, from the CDC to publish this sort of thing. And for the CDC to write it off as correct or factual, which she claims she did and the CDC approved everything, but we find out later on that the CDC had no idea of what they were talking about and Beatrice Sparks never contacted them. They found a lot of consistencies and almost line-for-line -line similarities between Alice's journal, Jay's journal, and now Nancy's journal. And again, there were more journals like this that popped up where Beatrice Sparks claimed to have interviewed thousands of homeless teens and gotten the inside scoop, but there was like, like line for line, just similarities. Pretty much every journal that she edited and released had quotes of people endorsing it, but their specialties or kind of who this person was definitely were made up. It was just a couple lines saying, you know, this is great. Specifically, in Nancy's case, late October 1993, the book is now titled It Happened to Nancy, Sparks has obtained glowing quotes from two doctors. One says, Only when one has been intimately involved with a real AIDS-infected person like Nancy can one slightly comprehend the overwhelmingness of the disease. Milton Norbaum, MD, AIDS specialist. In overwhelmingness, perhaps Dr. Norbaum had spent too much time with Beatrice Sparks, who slaps Ness, N-E-S-S, on every other word, exoticness. Delectableness, absoluteness, amazingness. And then another person was Dorian Hadley, stalker, psychiatrist working with AIDS. These just really didn't seem plausible or like people. And for people that were questioning it, they were able to go to some of the archives where Beatrice had altered some of Alden Barrett's journal to make it seem like it was the actual journal because they found inconsistencies with Alden Barrett's girlfriend. Her name in real life was Teresa, but in the diary, Jay's journal, it was Tina. But as we saw with some of the original journal entries, you saw Tina instead of Teresa. Then suddenly we come to an interlude where the author interrupts us just one more time to tell us the next part is going to sound a little crazy, where he says, there's no way around this, so let's deal with it now. What follows is altered for privacy. I know how that sounds, especially after 300 pages explaining why truth is fiction, war is peace, there is no spoon, etc. If you choose to doubt, I won't blame you. That said, if you've made it this far, perhaps I've accrued a little trust. In the next two chapters, I'll tell you what I know and do my best to protect the innocent. That this story exists at all is on Beatrice Sparks. Not causing further harm is on me. And he goes into detail about this youth camp that was popular 
for uh, Mormon teens to go to, which allegedly is where Beatrice Sparks got the idea for Alice. And this was more of a, I guess, tangible story rather than the one of her taking it from a psychiatrist session and it being from one of her patients. It's still, again, like the author says, so up in the air. We really don't know the truth. And for a minute while I was reading this, I was curious if this all even happened, because it was so crazy to me. And I knew it had happened, obviously. In the beginning, in the author's note, he does specify this is a true story. Not only does he say this is a true story, but he says no dialogue is invented if it's in quotes someone said it. Inner monologues and paraphrased statements are italicized and come from diaries, written records, interviews, and other concrete research. Journal entries, news blurbs, and the like are edited for clarity and brevity, which is kind of a given with nonfiction books. You know, all errors are mine, but I did my best. But it was almost kind of mind, like Twilight Zone almost, where it felt like maybe this is all made up. But it, it didn't. Like, it, it exists. But it was very interesting to read. And I hope I explained it well enough and kind of gave you an idea of what exactly was, was happening in this book. But again, I just cannot stress enough how great this book was. And I, I highly, highly recommend it. Again, if you would like to join us in September to discuss it uh, with the rest of the group, the link to join is in the bio. It's an invite-only link. We use the amazing site Book Club. So just go ahead and give that a click and then join us. I actually threw this in to be discussed after reading it. We kind of had planned in the next couple of months, but I threw it in September because once I had finished it, I was like, I need somebody to talk to about this because I don't see anybody else having read this. And I just, there's so much I need to say. <laughs> the first time I recorded this review, it was three hours and I just, I could not shut up about it. And I was reading line for line because I have most of this book underlined anyway. And it's just really remarkable because, again, I learned so much. How were people able to get away with stuff like this? And again, it just involved topics that I'm very fascinated in. I promise you this book is worth it. I was not paid to promote this book at all. I, I picked this up on my own from my local bookstore down in Davidson, North Carolina. And I, I again, I just... I really hope I encompassed everything and you do eventually pick up Unmask Alice. And I would, I would go ahead and say, go read, go ask Alice if you are able to get a copy of it. It might make the story just a little bit better. If you like these sort of reviews, please let me know. Go ahead and subscribe, leave a like, do the YouTube thing. You know how that works. Leave a comment. Tell me what else I should read. I have a couple of different books lined up that I plan on reviewing pretty soon. Unfortunately, nothing I have loved as much as this one. So... We will get to those later. I know most of you have probably found the YouTube from TikTok, but if you don't already follow me, my true crime page is You Can Call Me Patches, and then my book talk page is Patches Paper Cut. And of course, Instagram, all, this, all those things will be in the bio. You know where to find me. The internet is vast. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. I will see you guys very soon with another Morbidly Curious review.